thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to preach just for a little bit this morning on learning to pray, learning to pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you once again for the privilege of being in your house. We thank you, Lord, for everything that's been said, uh, Lord, uh, accomplished, the offering, the singing. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for for all these things, Lord. And uh, but Lord, we all understand that, Lord, it all leads up to the preaching of your word. It's it's the foolishness of preaching, Lord, that you have chosen to challenge our lives. And so, Lord, we we humbly set before you, and I pray that God that that as we enter into the topic of prayer, that, Lord, you would help us to be challenged, Father. Help us to be challenged by this format that Christ laid out for each and every one of us. And, Father, we pray a special prayer once again for Angel, that, God, you would come down and touch his body. Lord, bring healing to him, Father. Lord, we love and appreciate you in Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. I want to sneeze, and I... I am not doing it. It's lingering. <laughs> Excuse me. To pray. Various scholars have called this patch passage of Scripture the Lord's Prayer, while others call it the Disciples' Prayer. Personally, I lean to the disciples' prayer because if you look at this same prayer given in Luke uh, chapter 11, the disciples simply ask Jesus, uh, teach us to pray. And Jesus leads them in this format in Luke chapter 11, verse 1. Along with this, if you would look into John chapter 17, you don't have to turn there, but in John chapter 17 is recorded the Lord's Prayer. That is the that whole chapter is is the Lord's Prayer. Um, now, you know, I I don't know why it is that way. You know, a lot of scholars call it the Lord's Prayer. Um, personally, I don't see it that way. There are those that also say that it's 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 labeled wrong, and uh, but but it is a a instruction on on how to pray and pray and pray correctly now before we get into this i want you to keep in mind that context is always king what we mean by context is what is said around this passage of of scripture in verses one through five jesus is instructing his disciples in the giving of alms do you give alms you know, just a rhetorical question. You know, what are alms? Alms is is when you see somebody in need and you just help them out. Uh, you know, the alms is a very, very important part of Jewish culture. When we lived in Sierra Leone, uh, every Saturday, I believe it was, the a little boy would lead the blind. The, we, we called them the beggars because that's unfortunately what they were. They were poor, they were blind, and it was what the Bible calls the blind leading the blind. There'd be a little boy like Seth's age or something, and, and he would have a stick about this long, and he would have it in his hand, and behind him would be a blind man holding on to that stick. Well, and then that blind hand in his uh, in that blind man in his other hand would have a stick, and another blind man would be holding on to that stick, and it just went. And there might be eight or ten blind men being led about the town by this little boy. And uh, what that little boy would do is he'd go uh, uh, around to all the businesses. 
and and the blind people would would stand out there, the blind men, and they would they would start begging. And of course, the, the merchants would come out and and give money and things like that. They would come to our mission, and uh, we would try to help them out as well. That's giving alms, uh, seeing people in need. Of course, my my take on giving alms is not waiting for somebody to come and ask for it. Uh, but seeing a need and just wanting to help out. Uh, and so Jesus opens up this chapter with uh, Matthew 6 in giving them instruction on almsgiving. Don't do it to be seen of men. You know, just don't, don't uh, sound your trumpet. Because the Pharisees were, were notorious for that. You know, look at what I'm doing. I give to this and I give to that. You know, well, Jesus said they got their reward right when they opened their mouth and started blowing their trumpet. But you're supposed to give alms as discreetly as you can. And uh, sometimes it, 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 it's not done discreetly, or I mean, it can't be avoided. You know, people look and see what you're doing. I've given alms uh, around my family. They're sitting there and, uh, you know, and it, it is what it is. I, I, I don't do it for that. But I try to, to, to be as discreet as I can. And, you know, buying somebody a meal or giving them some money or, or whatever it might be. I, I try to give alms. And, and so that's what verses 1 through 5 is about, instructing his disciples in how to give to the needy in a correct manner. Verses 6 through 8, Jesus instructs them into uh, how should I pray? Or where should I pray? Let's put it that way. Where should I pray? Jesus said, enter into your closet and shut the door. And the father that, let, let me just read it. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, verse 6. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to the father which is in secret. And thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. And so what he's saying there is literally just find a place to hide, you know, uh, uh, you know, a place of, of solitude and, and, and have your prayer time there. Have your communion with the Lord. The Pharisees were, were notorious for standing on the street corner and with their phylacteries and, and, uh, and they would pray out loud to be seen of men. And, and he says, that's vain. You don't want to do it that way. But just find your own little prayer closet. And, and you know, uh, it, it can be a, a literal closet. My wife and I have a walk-in closet, and I have a, a, a kneeling bench in there. I haven't used it for a long time because after I built my office above the garage, that became my prayer closet or my prayer office. That's where I spend all my time and uh, or our bedroom. So I hope you understand what I'm saying. Just find a place where you can meet with God. It doesn't have to be in public. And and, and so then in verses 9 through 13, Jesus gives a syllabus as to the content that should be in one's prayer life. Now this is important that that you understand this. And because uh, a lot of people just simply don't know how to pray. And, and, and that's why we're here. That's, that's why this, this question was asked to Jesus, you know, Lord, teach us to pray. And he said, okay, I'll teach you. And this is how you do it. Amen. And so the, uh, if you would look on past that and uh, you would see where there's instructions in fasting and so on. But I, I want to throw out a caution here. Uh, the disciples' prayer, verses 9 through 13, is not meant to be used as a repetitious or continuous quoting um, for a substitute for your prayer life. There's a lot of people that do that. They just, you know, I, I know people that do that. When you ask them pray to pray over the meal, they'll sit there with their eyes closed and they'll go, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 
uh, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And that's, that's their prayer. They recite that over and over again. It's not, it's not meant to be recited like that. It's meant for you and I to understand the content that should be in our prayer. Since January of this year, I want to say right from January 1, I've asked the Lord to help me to see the deeper meaning of using this syllabus that He gave to His disciples for my own personal prayer life. And let me say to you here this morning that, you know, being in this for 40 years, it has been a blessing to me to say the least. Uh, more accurately, I, I should put it this way. I ha- th- th- This format or syllabus has revolutionized my prayer life. And I've been in this for 40 years. It's revolutionized my prayer life. I was sharing this with my wife, and she said, well, you need to share that with the church. And so I thought, okay, I will. And that's why we're addressing this here this morning. So let, let's, let's look into the disciples' prayer. Now, you know, creating an atmosphere of, of prayer is very difficult today. It's difficult for me because I, I, I wear so many different hats have a business, you know, I got projects at home, I have my wife, I have, you know, my kids, my grandkids. There's so many things going on in my life to to find time to to cultivate an atmosphere where I can focus on Him. That's that's hard. It's hard for me. It may not be for you, but I I think it is because it it is what it is. We we live in a very, very busy, busy uh, environment. Our our lifestyles are are, are busy. Uh, Everything's fast. It's quick. Uh, And it's not letting up. It just seems to be snowballing, going quicker and quicker and quicker uh, in life. But proper focus is so crucial (coughs) when we enter into prayer. How many times, now once again, I'm I'm gonna bring up some rhetorical questions here. But how many times do we offer up prayer and right from the very onset, we say, Lord, this is what I need. It's, you know, and this is what I see. Um, thank you, God. Give me a good night's rest. That was good. It's a new day. You know, help me, you know, through the day to make the right decisions. And, you know, my, you know, my, my son-in-law is, is, is sick with diabetes and Lord help him help, you know, my wife and, and, you know, and we just kind of, you know, throw things up in the air and, and, uh, and 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 see you tomorrow, Lord, and or later on today, or something like that. And, and and I know I'm being an extremist here, but I'm not missing it by far. We just kind of throw something up, and without any proper focus. And Jesus, when he when he when he instructs these disciples to prayer, what he wants us to do is get focus first. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Number one, he says, after this manner. In other words, do it this way. That's what he's saying in verse uh, nine. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. I got a scratch in my throat. He goes, our father, our father. Now, now now I'm telling you here that if you really try this, it will really help you. Get your focus first, number one. Do it this way, our Father. In other words, it's not about me. It's about Him. It's about us. Us focusing on him first. Now, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'm just going to be transparent this morning. That that has been a challenge for me when I when I pray, because it's all about me, Lord. This is what I've got to have. This is what what I'm up against, and I need wisdom for this. And I'm and, and I'm not I'm not seeing it as being selfish. I'm really not. But that's not what Jesus says here. He says it's about us, our Father. 
who art in heaven. And so it, you know, you trying to, to get your focus on him and as a, as a body of believers, as a church or as a family, it's challenging. It really is. It causes you to, to sit there or kneel there, however you pray. And, and Lord, how can I do this right then? If it's not about me, well, then it's about my family. <clears throat> it's about my, my church. It's about my friends and so on. Um, I, I shared this with you earlier on. And, and once again, when we lived in, in Sierra Leone, their culture in Sierra Leone was so much more applicable to Scripture than what American culture is. And something that I really, I really try to do on a daily basis, I, I mean, I, I do this. Um, when I'm in prayer, one of the first things I do to get my focus is I'll say, good morning, God. How are you? And that's, and, and I'll, I'll sit there and, and I'll say, Father, I trust everything's going according to your will. Um, and, and the reason why I greet him is because in Sierra Leone, in their culture, when you walk up to somebody at the beginning of the day or during the middle of the day or, or even towards evening, if you just walk up to them and, and open up into a conversation, a lot of times they'll just look down because it's extremely rude. But if you, if you greet that person, say, Christiana, how are you today? And Christiana will reciprocate and she'll go, I'm fine, how are you? And, and then I'll say, well, how, how's your body? How are you feeling? everything well? And she'll say, yeah, I'm, I'm doing all right. How are you feeling? And I'll say, I'm doing all right. You see, we're showing an interest in that individual. We're getting our, our, our mindset off of us or off of me and focusing, I'm really interested in you, God. And, and sometimes I'll, I'll start laughing. I'll say, Lord, how can I greet you when you know everything that's going on simultaneously all the time? And, and uh, so it challenges me because I want to be reverent and, and, and I want to be respectful, amen, but I, I want him to know that I'm sincere in considering him before myself, because Jesus said, our Father. Here the other, the other day, and, and, and you, you, my family, I mean, you, I, I, I do this all the time, or I try to all the time. When I go out to eat, like the other night, we went to Famous Dave's. And Debbie and I and Rachel were the only ones there. And, and uh, the waitress comes up and, he, and immediately she goes, can I get you a drink? And I said, um, or she goes, my name's Debbie. She says, what can I get you to drink? And I just put on the brakes. I said, Debbie, I'm Mike. And, uh, and she looks at me and I go, this is my wife, Debbie. Oh, you're a Debbie too. And, and Rachel, and, and everything just opened up. And she goes, you know, the, you know, she started reciprocating. We were more, she's seen that we were more interested in her as an individual than her as a waitress. And so she started talking to us. I, I try to do this all the time. And uh, I mean, Kevin and Peter, we, we eat out a lot. And, and uh, the, the, I mean, I, I, I try to do this. A lot of times I'll ask the waitress, I'll, she'll, she'll bring me a meal. and It'll be really big. And I say, would you like to sit down and join us? You know, and and uh, just letting them know that I'm really interested in their life as an individual. You try it sometime. Going through the checkout line, I, I always ask, how's everything in your life? Or, or my line is, how's everything in your little world? And they'll say, well, my little world's doing all right. And I'll say, well, we're on the same planet then because mine's doing all right too. But I, I, I try to, you know, some people, they just look at you like, whoa, where'd you come from? But when you really try to, to, to practice that in your life with people that you meet, and there's been times I've, I, I, I've walked up to somebody and, and I'll, I'll get into a conversation, but I'll put on the brakes and, I'll, and, I, and, and I want them to notice this. I'll put on the brakes and I'll say, how are you doing? And they'll just look at me like, I'm doing all right. How are you doing? I'll say, I'm doing fine. But they notice that I, I want them to notice that I'm considering them before the, my, my conversation. 
And, 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 and that's what I try to be with God. I, I, I want God, even though he's God, and I'm just Mike Metzger, and I don't have the vernacular and the abilities to really see him as I should see him, but I try. I try. I show an interest in him. Amen. How things are going with him. And, 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 and sometimes I get so caught up in that. Uh, Lord, I, 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 I know you're doing good because you're God and nothing takes you by surprise. But, but Lord, it's, this, this planet is rough. It's rough. And, and I'm so glad you're God and your father, you know, that you can ha- handle all this. Amen. But Jesus goes on. He says, after this manner, our father uh, uh, in heaven. Now, now it, and, and once again, I'm not asking you to, to do everything verbatim that, that, that I'm doing, but I'm asking you to challenge yourself to get this, to tailor this for yourself when you pray. His position, heaven, allows me the comfort and assurance that he sees all simultaneously. Now, what I'm doing here, I, I keep journals, and I'm reading to you out what I've written down over the, this past year, in my, this past nine months in my journals. You know, God sees everything. It, it, it's it's kind of like, you know, the, the times that we fly and... and you're you're coming into Missoula uh, Airport, and what is you know, on a clear day? And you're coming down, and and uh, as you get closer, and, and and the way that the planes come, I've seen our house, and you know our neighborhood, and so on. But you get lower and lower, and you get into Missoula, you see Reserve Street, and you see all them cars, you know, and you you see the 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 football field over there, Grizzly Football Stadium. You see you see everything. There's a perspective. There's a focus there that. That, 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 that's really cool. Of course, the way that my mind works, I always think, how many of these people are saved that are scurrying about like ants on the ground? How many are saved? But then I, you know, I, when, when I think of my Father who art in heaven, God sees everything simultaneously. He is everywhere because He sees everywhere. And so when, when, when I'm praying to him and I have this consolation that he not, he not only goes, knows what's going on in the Ukraine, he, he knows what's going on in Africa and, and other places, all, all around the globe, he knows what's going on, but he's watching Mike Metzger as well. Because he's in heaven. And he sees everything. He goes on and he says, hallowed be thy name. Now, now keep in mind, Christ is saying, Open your prayer life with this. Showing an interest in him. Hallowed be thy name. Several months ago, Leah gave me a devotional and, and uh, that explained the pronunciation of that Hebrew name, Yahweh. We call it Yahweh. Now, and I, I did, matter of fact, this comes from Dr. Stan Helton. I looked it up. I did research on this. And we as English people, we, in order to pronounce certain words, and even some of the, the, in the Jews, in order to pr- pronounce certain words, they use vowels and consonants. Because Yahweh is, is really spelled Y-W-H-W. Is that right? Y W. Um, H-W. Let me look here, make sure. Yeah, Y-W-W-H is, is, is the way Yahweh is spelled in Hebrew. You can't pronounce that. But if you put co- vowels and consonants in it, it says Yahweh. But I, I looked up a, a in, in Hebrew, I looked up how do you pronounce Y- uh, Huh? Y W H W. That that's still not right. Y W W H. How do you pronounce that? And I found a Hebrew that pronounced it, and the and it was so cool. The camera was focused just on his mouth, and he goes,
It's breathing that says the name of God. When a baby is born, when that baby takes its first breath, it's saying, <laughs> even the atheists, whether they accept it or not, they're saying the name of God. The very last breath that you take will be. <sighs> and so in, in my prayer life, I'll sit there. And of course, I, you know, I'll say, Father, you're so awesome and magnificent and high and lofty, and then I'll sit there and I'll go. And I'll start laughing because it's so cool. I get so caught up in it. You probably think I'm strange here this morning, but, but that's, that's the way I pray. My, 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 my prayers are, are, are meant to have meaning in them, and, and I try to tailor my prayer life to my personality, and, but yet to the, to the format that Jesus lays out before us. Amen. And then he goes on and he says, thy kingdom come. In Matthew 6.33, on down in this same chapter, Jesus said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Amen. In Luke 17, 21, neither shall they say, Lo, here or lo, therefore behold, the kingdom of God is within you. When you get saved, Christ comes and lives in you. Amen. And so there's an element of his kingdom that is within you and I. In 1 John 3, 1 through 3, behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is, and every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Let me ask you this here this morning. When's the last time you asked for his kingdom to come? When's the last time you had that earning? God, I want your kingdom to come. And then he goes on and he says, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As crazy as things seem to be in our present day, my consolation, my peace of mind is found in his will. Bringing our heavenly father into our prayers first sets the tone for everything else that Jesus asks us to do. Always remember perspective is everything. And so once you've opened up your prayer life and you've focused your mind upon him, only then are we able to evaluate our needs and our wants before him. I, I, I tell you what, when you get into this, I mean, just get into it, you'll find out that, man, Man, it's, I've been doing this for 15 or 20 minutes already, and I ain't even got into my own needs yet. It's, it's, it, it, it's just so good. But you got you to, gotta, the key to it is you got to set this time aside because it's going to take you a while. You get caught up in it. And then after you've focused on him, all the pain and the hurt and the needs that you have in your life are seemingly a whole lot less. They don't seem as important anymore because you got caught up with him. And that's exactly what Jesus wants us to do. Get caught up with him first, who he is and what he's all about first. Amen. And then we can move on where it becomes our issue. Give us, us, this day our daily bread. Now there's a Twofold inference here. And once again, I'm just reading to you basically out of my, my journals here. Number one, daily bread is feasting from his word daily. Uh, daily. I must have his word daily to enable me to navigate through this life, the issues of life. Daily bread. He is the bread of life. There's so much you could preach a whole message on bread, him being the bread of life. In Psalm 119.05, oh 
It says, Thy word, 119, 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. Amen. In John 17, 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. And, and, and I'm not asking you to, you know, sometimes we get caught up in this thing, well, I've got to read through the Bible. And, and I encourage everybody to read through the Bible, but take your time. Try to understand what you're reading. Get hooked on it. It's, it's meat and fatness for your soul. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, now I'm going to really put the pressure on. This is what God has showed me. He goes on and he says, and forgive us our debts. Now, keep in mind, I, I'm not an English scholar here, but and is a conjunction. In other words, it goes with what was already said. Give us this day our daily bread. You've got to have that. And this goes right along with it. Forgive us our debts. In other words, forgiveness is linked to our daily intake of bread. Let me just boldly say this here this morning. That from Genesis to Revelation, you and I have before us, it's on your lap, you see me reading from it here, a book with the greatest theme that's ever been written, a theme on forgiveness, on forgiveness. Once again, as I quoted Brother Zane, or uh, uh, he, it's not an exact quote. I kind of tweaked it, I think. But he said, this is the only book that you can read where this book will read you back. It'll talk to you back. That's what I love about the Word of God. We must learn to walk in forgiveness. It is our way of life. As a Christian, well, just a minute, Pastor. I gave my life to Christ, and I asked him to forgive me of my sins. Yeah, that's cool, awesome. You became a Christian. But it, forgiveness doesn't stop there. I don't know about you, but things happen all the time in my life that I say, whoa, Lord, forgive me. I shouldn't have said that, shouldn't have looked at that. Th th yesterday morning, here, here's, a, here's a, an example. We got on Messenger, you know, the internet is, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's a bittersweet thing. You know, we were in Africa, we know some people over there, and, and you know, but a lot of the Africans have, the Sierra Leoneans have the same name. They, and so there's this one name, Debbie says, hey, so-and-so is sending you a message. And so I clicked on it, and when I clicked on it, it was the most vulgar. I mean, vulgar don't even do right to the description of it. I'm trying to push the button, you know, I'm, to, to get out of this thing. It was so trashy. And I, I told Debbie, I said, don't look at that. It was bad. And it was just an innocent email from a, a, a lady that, that we thought we knew. But man, when I quick clicked on it, oh. And uh, man, when I made it to my office, I said, oh, God, forgive me. Of course, I, I didn't intentionally look for that. I, I, I hope you understand me. But I felt so bad for seeing that. It, it wasn't so much a visual as it was the audible. The, 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 the verbiage was terrible. That's, that's what was disgusting. And so I said, oh, God, forgive me. Uh, help, help me not to get caught in things like that. Or, and I, I was as innocent as innocent could be. But that's the way that I, that, that's the way that I walk. I just don't, you know, slough it off. It, it bothered me. It really bothered me. And, and I don't want those things in my life. I, 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 I simply don't. Amen. Keep in mind that forgiveness is connected to the intake of daily bread. Is where, in our daily bread is where our forgiveness is found. As we discover this forgiveness, we are then able to understand the seriousness of forgiving others that offend us. Because he goes on and he says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And I tell you, I could stop there. We could have an altar service. You can bawl and squall because this is something that people really struggle with. 
Do you see what so-and-so did to me? You see how they talked to me? Saved or unsaved? We struggle with that. Well, if you're not getting, if you're not understanding forgiveness from the Word of God, if you're not understanding how, how crucial, how critical it is to, to stay in that mode of forgiveness before God, then you're not going to be able to understand forgiveness towards one another. Remember, it's about us, not me. Amen. Forgive us, our debtors. They who cannot forgive others cannot understand the forgiveness of God. They have no depth in it. He goes on. Lead me not into temptation. Now, keep in mind, these are all connected. So, <laughs> this is what I wrote down. <laughs> is there a temptation not to seek forgiveness of God. Is it possible that we take his forgiveness for granted? Like when I seen that message yesterday. Ah, Lord knows I wasn't looking for that and it just popped up. Is it possible that we take that for granted? I, you know, I... I to be honest with you, I don't think there was any residuals from that if, if I wouldn't have taken the time, but it bothered me to the extent where, Lord, forgive me for seeing that or hearing that. I don't want to take God's forgiveness for granted. Amen. The Apostle Paul exhorted the church at Corinth to examine themselves before partaking of communion. But let a man examine himself. Judge yourself. That's what this, this is all about. Amen. The, the, the point is this. Is it possible that we take the imperfections of being human as part of our Christianity when we are not supposed to? Do the wrongs that we experience from others because become so routine that we fail to walk in forgiveness? Again, we're not supposed to. Let me say that forgiveness is our daily bread, and daily bread always leads one to walk in forgiveness. Failure to live your life this way has consequences, dire consequences. Because he goes on and he says, lead, uh, uh, lead me from, temp uh, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I don't want to be tempted not to be, to be an unforgiving person. I don't want to be tempted that way. But if I, if I am an unforgiving person, then what he says is deliver us from evil. To not walk in forgiveness in the eyes of God is simply evil. How can we be unforgiving when God gave everything that he had, his son, so that we could be forgiven? Remember, it's all about his kingdom, his power, it's his glory forever. And that word forever in the Greek means an unbroken age, perpetuity of time, eternity. Let me say this, folks. Forgiveness is the key to eternal life. You can't have it without that key. You simply can't. Lastly, a lot of people quote this Lord's Prayer, verses 9 through 13, but always they never read verses 14 and 15. For is also a conjunction. It can be used as a preposition, but it, here it's used as a conjunction. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. That's the disciples' prayer in its entirety. Forgiveness is required for those who have been forgiven. 
One writer put it this way. This is not my thought. I don't know who wrote this. But we are not given the luxury of holding on to our bitterness towards other people. Here the emphasis is on the imperative of forgiveness. On the fact that it is not an option. In closing here this morning, are you a forgiving person? Are you? We're talking about learning to pray. And trust me, if you, if you go through this, and, and then all the other peripheral things, the Holy Spirit will just so tailor this for your personal prayer life. Other people will come in and needs and wants, and it just opens up your mind to so much more than, than what you've been doing. And, and I'm not trying to discredit your prayer life, but it could, you could sure enhance it by doing it after this manner, as Jesus said. As Hannah comes to the piano, Corey Ten Boom um, was a, wrote several books, The Hiding Place. She was a watchmaker in Holland in World War II. And she, her famous book, The Hiding Place, I believe it was. She was on James Dobson years ago. Corey Ten Boom. I've heard, I've heard some of her audio tapes. Sweet, elderly lady. But when living in the Netherlands, being a watchmaker, when the Nazis took control of the Netherlands, Corey Ten Boone and her family, they, they would take Jews that were fleeing from captivity of, and being sent to concentration camps, they would take them and they had a, a room that, that they could hide them in, in their, their business. You know, like a, you go into the closet and there's a wall behind the closet. You move the door and you go in and there's another room and they would have people in there. Well, consequently, they, they were found out and Corey Ten Boom was sent to concentration camp. And it was there that she said that she experienced some hor horrific things from prison guards. She said she struggled with this forgiveness. It was there in the concentration camp where she accepted Christ as her Lord and Savior. And understanding how he forgave her, she couldn't forgive. And she was sharing after she uh, won her freedom, after the war was over, and uh, she was sharing this with a pastor. And this pastor at their church had a, a, bell, a, a, a bell tower. And the pastor said, let me explain what forgiveness is to you. He said, before church, the sexton will come and he will grab that rope and he will pull down on that rope and that bell will begin to, to ring. It'll begin to to ring loud. But he said, the sexton will let go of the rope and walk away, but that bell will keep ringing. It'll keep ringing by its own momentum until it gets less and less and less until it stops. He said, that's the way forgiveness works. It doesn't happen just overnight. But when you let go of the rope, eventually the sound will stop. But he said, too many people just hang on to the rope and keep the bell ringing. You see, that's unforgiveness. Just let go of it. After a while, the sound will cease. If we could just understand the importance of this here daily. Because on every page in this word here 
it either points to or looks back at forgiveness or the need for it. It's so important that Jesus said when his disciples, Lord, teach us to pray. And he said, after this manner, pray ye therefore, our Father. It all starts with him. It's all about him. But you see, we get it backwards, don't we? We just do. We throw up our Hail Marys or <laughs> hope, hope that something will hit the ears of God. But I'm here to tell you this morning, if you, uh, if you do it the way Jesus tells you to do it, you'll have a, an audience every time you enter into your prayer closet. <laughs> it's pretty cool. It really, it really is. I, it's revolutionized my life. And this is extremely personal, and here we put it on the internet. <laughs> but we're living in a time where we have to understand the importance of praying. Because times are getting difficult, and they're going to get more difficult. And I don't want all these difficulties and issues in life that are coming up and that are yet to be unfolded tomorrow, I don't want them to deter me from my spiritual life. I want my spiritual life to help me to navigate through those things. Amen. Let's stand. Father, we thank you once again for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you give us the mode of prayer, how to, to pray. Lord, we miss it so many times. Lord, I've, I've missed it for years. And Lord, I know I've had a prayer life for years. I understand that. But Lord, to really understand how you want us to pray, Lord, has really helped me personally. It, it just has. Lord, forgiveness is everything. We are so quick to offend one another. We're so quick to be offended. And yet, Lord, it, it is a crucial element in our Christianity. It just is. It's, it's just interesting out of the number one theme of the disciples' prayer is focus on God. Number two is being in your word. Number three is forgiveness. Just like that. Those three elements. It's all about God. It's all about his word. And his word's all about forgiveness. So Lord, help us to understand that. Help it to sink in, help us to walk in it, to live in it. And Lord, like always, Father, we'll give you the glory and the praise and the honor. Amen. The altar is open this morning.